Coming to you from the all-new Live House in Hollywood, California. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Pensado's Place. Our guest is one of the hottest composers in gaming and television today. You're going to meet her in a second. But first, we always want you to sign up for our newsletter, click like and subscribe, hit us up on all of our social media so we can converse back with you. Um, with credits like Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, Chef's Table on Netflix, NASA's Cassini Project, and on and on and on, Sarah Shackner is on fire. Uh, we are thrilled that she even knows who we are, and we're even more thrilled to have her here. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm good. really excited What's to be that? here. Good, good, good. good. Um, it, it, we've had some folks on from film and television before, because we see audio as this big, inclusive thing. Mm -hmm. um, what's fascinating about you, for me in particular, is I'm a first-person shooter guy. So Call of Duty, I've played all of them, and so on and so forth. And I was so familiar with the work that you had done on Call of Duty. One of the signatures that's so interesting about what you do is there seems to be Sarah's personality <laughs> in what you do. Is that is that a plan? Is that something that they give you leeway to do? Because there's an emotional kind of scope and scale in the music that you make. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. That's definitely a goal for me to, yeah. to put myself into what I'm doing, not just satisfy what the game needs, but also put myself into it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, the game projects have, they, they give me a lot of freedom to do that. Yeah. So that's, That's amazing. One of the reasons why I love working on them. Mm -hmm. Because um, I was telling the team, if you go through the end, I go to lots of movies, mm -hmm. and if you go through the end credits of a game, it's about 45 minutes. Oh my God, things. so many people. And it's unbelievable the amount of people. Yeah. So the idea that they would allow you leeway to do what you need to do with such, and it's so compartmentalized. There's ambient music and combat mm -hmm. and chapters and storyline and all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. And you have to be unique inside all of that and find the elements. Is that definitely, yeah. Um you're not just writing whatever you want, like mm -hmm. two hours of music, here it is, mm -hmm. do it do what you want with it. It's all broken out into very specific technical assets that will be going into the game mm. um so yeah that's it's very detail heavy are you working from a storyboard and video or how do how do you know where you're going um well they do give some kind of like what we're seeing here mm -hmm. it kind of looks like you're in it right mm -hmm. now <laughs> looking mm -hmm. at right, you exactly um but um yeah they'll give rough gameplay videos in the beginning mm -hmm. just so you can kind of get a feel for like okay this mission has this type of pacing um, but you're not scoring sync points like you would in a film and mm -hmm. you're not really scoring under dialogue. Mm -hmm. So as long as you know what the goal is that you're achieving with the music, what the different energy levels you're going to need to cover, mm -hmm. you have a lot of freedom of how you execute that and how you do that. Do you do, do, you do multiple pieces of music for, for the same scene? And like a movie, you would have one one score for the, for a particular moment, mm -hmm. but in a, in a in a game you have to have multiple pieces for the same scene, right? Right. Uh, how many usually? Um, it's not as much that I'm writing a bunch of different pieces for one scene. It's mm -hmm. that it's a different approach to writing. You have to. It's thinking of it a little more modular. Like when I'm writing a piece, sometimes I'll have to put extra layers, extra instruments, doing something that maybe uh, musically yeah. I would not want to be there just. Mm -hmm for how I would want the music to sound. Mm -hmm. But um, that way the editors can much more easily take it apart and then create different variations from the original piece that you wrote. Because oftentimes you're creating for situation, yes. not for outcome. Exactly, correct? yeah. Yeah, um, because I know as a player, what I do can change. Right, it can change like at any minute. Any any second. So it's like, so. yeah, if you're playing and you're starting at a mission, you've crossed a threshold mm -hmm. where then those enemies are going to start coming at you mm -hmm. in the system. It triggers something that's like, oh, now we need to bring in this second part of the piece mm -hmm. or this layer that's going to play indefinitely. It's fascinating. W would you say that, that a lot of the music that you contribute it would be categorized as atmospheric? Um, a lot of it, yeah. Uh, is that atmospheric, something you enjoy? Yeah, because it's, it's creating 
environments, like mm-hmm. nuanced emotional mm-hmm. environments mm-hmm. Um, that can kind of subtle, subtly just like permeate the background of what's going on. Um, yeah, I would say that's accurate. Would, would an atmosphere, and I, and I, I don't know anything about games, but <laughs> would, would a piece that's called atmospheric in a, in a game, would that be the same thing as a pad in a, a regular song, so, so to speak? Um, it could be. I think when I, when I think of atmospheric, I would think something that's not aggressive, not in your face, mm-hmm. a little more sits in the background, uh, a bed mm-hmm. of something, mm-hmm. ambient. Um, but some, then, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No. I was okay. going to say it, but then that changes if you have to do combat. Right. That's or not atmospheric that's not, that's at all. Like in your, in your yeah. Movie. And that's like most of the, in this type of game and a lot of the action adventure games, it's a lot of combat music. Yeah. It, what's interesting about your scores is that I found that you would have combat elements in that would sometimes switch, like like drum hits would feel like shots sometimes, but they would switch, or there'd, there'd be a sound or a pad that sort of felt like helicopter mm. rotors, but they were a musical element. And then your emotional landscape stuff um, was always sort of, creative things I couldn't quite identify. And I know cool. might be some Trent Reznor <laughs> feelings in there, but also you I'll would utilize that. different things for percussions, almost like a Foley approach to yeah. getting sound. Is yeah. that correct? I do do a lot of that. I like found sounds. Um, I really don't like working in the box or with mm-hmm. MIDI. Um, so I'm kind of always after capturing a performance, mm-hmm. first and foremost, and then working with that audio. And um, on Call of Duty, I did a bunch of experimental sessions. I I feel so lucky getting to work on these projects because, you know, the budgets are pretty huge. They're crazy. Yeah, they're pretty crazy. Like, uh, so there is money to do kind of experimental, maybe some avant-garde type sessions where it's an exploration. Mm. And that's my favorite thing Mm because I, I hate doing mock-ups that are then like, oh, the sound's going to be replaced later. And I'm like, well, that sound made me, made, me make decisions about other sounds yeah so like i don't i hate that i want to have as much of the raw um final sounds to work with well what's so cool also about what you do is because you're also such a good editor you'd rather create your own sarah sound yeah right (laughs) and and put it in and have it be not only inspiration but also tell the scene because lots of games have period right and you can have freedom like you can create Sarah, Philly, Egyptian <laughs> feel or whatever the case may be and take the player on a different kind of journey. Mm-hmm. But you find a way to, like on in Modern Warfare, we were talking about Farrah before the show yeah. started and just the story arc. But when it was her or throwbacks to her and her brother and they were growing up, I felt the period of time in the music, even though I couldn't quite identify it, it was enough that it authenticated it mm. for me. I didn't need to say, oh, this was, you know, the Circulian War, 1824. Right, right. It just needed to feel like Sarah. Hints at it. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Is, that, is that by design? That's, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to hear mm, that that comes across because mm-hmm. that is definitely um, a goal for me. And yeah, for uh, getting back to Farah, uh, that was really fun because I got to record some vocalists for that. And I don't mm. often work with vocalists. Mm-hmm. Um, and this... Uh, Rafe Perlman, fantastic vocalist. He's, he, he sings kind of Middle Eastern. He mm-hmm. was like pulling from Aramaic. Um, but it, it, but it was his own thing. And so nice. he was improvising. And then we had him, um, going through a tape delay, mm-hmm. like a analog tape echo. And so then I think in that mission that you're talking about, there's all these weird, tape echo like mm-hmm. divings but it's his voice mm. oh, so it has like that. a little bit of a M- middle eastern vibe but it also sounds like strange so cool so you like to um you like to use a lot of modulation i've, I've noticed in your music what, what do you get from that you think movement okay um things changing evolving i don't like static mm-hmm. yeah. maybe sometimes i do too much of that because it's yeah, like my so many work, things I like, I like i like things to move around a lot you know um, so mm-hmm. I'm always using a do you um some part of modulation. If you have um like an open world game like Assassin's Creed, mm-hmm. that requires different stuff from Sarah than a first person shooter, or is it kind of the same? Because open world there's it's so much bigger. It's bigger, right? 
and your yeah. imagination has to you have to go nuts oh my god into, yeah you have to like rip your brain inside out i mm. bet because i mean sometimes i'll just have a couple videos to go by and i'm writing for like 50 different side missions oh god. and so you have I mean, that's one of the biggest differences, and people are always asking me, what's the difference between scoring film and games? But one of the biggest th challenges is that, um, you know, you don't get those dailies every day with right. the, these amazing actors and the script that you know, and you right. know exactly what you're writing to. Right. On the game, it's like, it's all, in, you have to pull it out of your There's head. No, guardrails. no, it's you're all just, you. Because so. you already, you know, when I did research on you, you already seem like a mad scientist inside <laughs> your lair creating Sarah world, right? That's insane. That, yeah. It's like chaos theory. Chaos. Um, but that's where I think the brilliance comes in because obviously one, it works. And two, there's enough discipline in your method that by the time it gets to the end, it's something that supports the story and, and, yeah. and, and furthers the story. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. Me. I mean, that's always the primary focus. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't feel like I have to work too hard to make things sound like me. Mm -hmm. Like when I try to sound like other people, it still just sounds like me. So yeah, I'm, I'm I glad. guess that's a good thing. That is a good thing. <laughs> Do you, are you ever charged with, um, well, like, let me, let me backtrack. Seems like everything in life is about tension and release. So I'm, I'm assuming that that's still a, a process in the video game world. And, and if so, um, how do you, how do you, what techniques do you use to create tension and release in your music? Is it similar to the way we do it in a, in a song? Like, like in a song we would pre-chorus, we would pedal a sus4 or mm -hmm. put some like odd time signatures to create tension. Is that something you're sometimes charged with to create an emotion within a song? Yeah, for within sure. A, within a game? Um, for what's sure. What's your technique for that? I think, I mean, th with games, because the music is not narrative, you're not, you know, there's not constant changing of chords and melodies because mm -hmm. that can't loop and that would get right. really annoying mm -hmm. um, while you're playing. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just messing with dissonances and mm -hmm. um, getting comfortable with mm -hmm. things sounding uncomfortable mm -hmm. um, and hanging out on like a weird dissonant chord for yeah. a period so of time. a little bit similar to Yeah, I think it's world. similar. And, and, and you said the, you said loops. How, how long is an average loop usually, like 30 seconds, 10 seconds? Well, it depends because right. it depends what the person's doing. They'll have, like, pre-made edited loops uh -huh. of things, and then they can adjust the mix. So, like, oh, if, it, if this is played two times in a row, now we drop out this layer just to give it a little variation. Uh -huh. But it all depends on what the player's doing. If someone's really bad and just like in a wall, uh -huh. facing a wall and like can't get past one mission, uh -huh. they're going to be hearing those loops oh, a lot more than someone that just there, sped through. There comes your tension right there automatically. Yeah. At some point in time, and I don't know if you still do it, your dad actually mixed some stuff for he you, did. right? Yeah. How cool is that? It's so cool. Well, it's also hard to work with family. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, there would be times where he'd be like complaining about like me sending something late i'm like dad <laughs> dad you work for me <laughs> yeah <laughs> no he's amazing though he's i feel like because we're, we have the same dna we have very similar taste mm -hmm. and he just kind of like gets my music mm -hmm. which is really cool um but yeah he he did live sound back in the 70s oh, cool. he did jeff beck oh, jan nice. hammer wow. ma vishnu and mm -hmm. uh lou reed oh, and amazing. i miss lou reed amazing yeah and and the the gaming company, whoever it is, whether it's Ubisoft or whoever's hiring you, they allow you to control who mixes your soundtracks. Not stuff? always. I didn't. Yeah, I think, he's it's mixed. An amazing committee. Process, yeah, it's right? kind of a. It depends on the situation. He, um, the Assassin's Creed stuff, he's mixed because they just have a different approach mm -hmm. when it comes to audio than some of the other companies. Because mm -hmm. on Call of Duty and um, I think it was Anthem, they actually had Sony PlayStation as like a third party helping mm -hmm. and they're fantastic like they know what the hell they're doing mm -hmm. with game audio and they're just kind of there to help implement take the burden off the audio team mm -hmm. with some of the work of implementing and oversee the score mm -hmm. um so they've been fantastic is, is yeah. there and they a, mix is there a time frame that you get what's the shortest time frame you've had to turn something out what's the longest leeway for a whole time? game yeah they're really long um yeah. i i think the shortest maybe like a year right. or a little less than a year. Right. But typically anywhere from a year to a year and a half is when I come on wow. 
before the game, last year of development. And the video that you're getting is actually video from the game yeah. at that point in time. Which is very rough. So it's got to be super rough. Yeah. Right. Got it. Wow. So, wow. so public yeah. service announcement, um, you use a particular type of keyboard mm -hmm. a lot, M-O-O-G. So, so let's settle it once and for all. Is it Moog or Moog? I say Moog, but I learned recently that Bob Moog was okay with any pronunciation. So it can be either. It can be anything. That's disappointing. Mog, Moog. Mm, there was a third one that God, I can't remember. There was a third one. Mog. I wonder. Mog, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess it doesn't matter. I like Mog. I like Mog. Let's go with Mog. It feels. What does Mike Dean say? That's what we should do. Whatever Mike Dean <laughs> he says. He said Moog, and I was I was surprised. Well, if Mike Dean says Moog. It's Moog for me. <laughs> In the business structure of it, do composers get royalties with games? games? Yeah. Well, it's. You know, we we retain our writer's share, okay. but there's no syndication going on. Right. And I know there's a lot going on right now with trying to get a hold of that because, you know, Twitch streamers, mm -hmm. there, there's people that make a living and millions of people are watching them play these games every day. Yep. And nobody is collecting. Right. It, there's a, like, they should be. There's something. The internet is the new TV. Like, mm -hmm. TV is going away anyway. So mm -hmm. they need to change their definition of syndication. Mm -hmm at the government level. Also, the game studios are a little weird. Like, they don't like yeah. to register the tracks with the PROs. That's I'm crazy. Like, thanks. Hello. Like, there's some money I could be collecting here, absolutely. and you're not letting me. <laughs> and you made $600 million in, like, the first week. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. $600 million, yeah. So switch gears. If you take something like Chef's Table for Netflix, what changes about doing something for a TV show? Is it just more linear? There's set points that yeah. you're working within? Yeah. I see. It's very linear. You know exactly what you're scoring, gotcha. scene by scene. Um, you'll spot something mm -hmm. with the director or whatever. And then, yeah, it's broken up. Like, we need music here to here, here mm -hmm. to here. It's mm -hmm. very clear, like, where you're going to put music. Mm -hmm. And you support the dialogue and you support what's going on. So mm -hmm. you can't use all the as many of the weird sounds that I can just throw into a game track and <laughs> like can get away with it, you know? Did we ask you what the AW you're using yet? We asked um, I use Cubase. Oh, wow. Hmm. Well, is there a reason? Um, I'm sure there is. A lot of composers for visual media use it. It's pretty uh -huh. popular in that world, not as much with like producing. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. I was, I was in Digital Performer for eight years. It was traumatic and then I, <laughs> I switched over kind of randomly a friend of mine had switched and was like yeah it's working out well so I'm like okay I'll do it too and it was just so intuitive and my workflow became so much more creative and dynamic and um it just worked for me so and, and you're an analog synth lady correct yes and <clears throat> and so between analog synths and strings from there grows Sarah yeah is, is sprung from the Gotcha. Yeah, combining I I mean I'm I'm interested with like ancient manifestations of human creativity and then mm -hmm. um merging that with modern like cutting edge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. technology. Oh, I love it. Please so, don't ever change. What, 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 <laughs> well, I'm a guitar player and I, I don't understand this fascination with modular synthesizers. why modular synthesizers, why are they so popular again? I thought we got rid of them in the eighties. <laughs> Well, they, there's so much more variety now with all the Eurorack stuff. Mm -hmm. For me, I think I just, you know, I'm a musician. I play, I play piano, strings, mm -hmm. guitar, like mm -hmm. anything with strings my whole life. And so the way I write music channels through how I play instruments. Mm -hmm. But in a, instead of doing this, you just did this. No, it's different. Ow. No, it's different because it's pretty much the least musical thing. So trying to make music on the least musical machine is like yeah. an interesting challenge. I mean, yeah. I've also gotten better at learn understanding signal flow. I didn't know anything yeah. before. I walked up to one and never made a sound. I mean, that's how you couldn't make a sound. No, no. I, I, I see all those holes and knobs. <laughs> it's a steep learning curve. Yeah, I know. I'm a still bit. learning. I know a little bit, but. But I think it's, I, it's, it's they just look so cool when you're doing it. You look like a, yeah. a scientist in the lab or something. They do look cool, but I I think it's more about you can get very unexpected results on it. Mm -hmm. You can surprise yourself. Mm -hmm. Like I get sick of 
the same old chords and notes and things I play, like the same stuff that's mm -hmm. in my head. So it kind of allows me to approach music from a purely sh uh, sonic mm -hmm. approach of just mm -hmm. shaping sound yeah, mm -hmm. and being surprised by what's coming out. It, and would you say that, that there's a, a, let's use the term better, you can get a better sound from a modular than you could from a regular mm, flat I would, one? I don't think it's about better or worse, it's just a, a different, yeah, okay. it's a different type of sound you might be after. And I think we've had various creators here, we talked about this before the show as well, Sometimes that accident is where it is. Exactly. And you need something that helps you get to the accident. Exactly. Correct. That's totally it. And sometimes I'll just like get a patch going um, and have something in it that's causing evolving things over time. Mm -hmm. And then I'll kind of like step back, record it for half an hour, um, and then go back into the audio and be like, oh, that little thing was so cool. Yeah. Um, I actually did one of the main themes from Anthem the modular wrote like i didn't write it mm. it was like this not 20 minutes of non-stop 16th notes that, that is a sequence that was going mm -hmm. um and it was like a four minute shifting uh oscillator i think mm -hmm. it, so i was like scanning through four minutes mm -hmm. while it was going through these notes mm -hmm. and then there was this seven notes out of like five thousand notes mm -hmm. i just like heard them and was like that's I'm going to save that melody. Mm -hmm. And then now, like, I have orchestras playing it behind it. And it, it, it's just a different way to to come up with stuff. Yeah, that's cool. Well, it, might be, it might be the future, actually. <laughs> with well, AI. Yeah. <clears throat> we often talk about um, how important networking is and also pushing the envelope. So you actually worked on a NASA project, right? The Cassini project. How did yeah. that come about? Tell us about it. Oh, my God. That was, like the best thing ever um the uh, the art director at jpl reached out to me out of the blue and he just asked if i would want to be a part of this little project wow. commemorating the mission because it was coming to an end right. that year it had been circling saturn for 20 years and right. collecting data and sending it back to us and showing us what was on this amazing planet and mm -hmm. um to get to write a song that was whatever I want to just say goodbye to this mm -hmm. thing. Mm. It was, it was special. Yeah, I bet. It, and I, yeah, there were two other that artists would be emotional, that did it. I would think it was. Yeah, mm. yeah. We actually got to go to the the final descent when oh, wow. she was gonna burn up. Um, we got to go to JPL. It was at like four in the morning because she burned up in the atmosphere. Yeah, because right. after circling for twenty years, right. it came. Why were you guys to, calling a satellite a she? Oh, I just thought it was a she. Oh, uh, no, it's clearly a male. No, it's, <laughs> it's female. <laughs> we, okay. We have HR issues. Here, so, uh, um, but speaking of networking, even the way you got into, because, you know, we talked about this as well. I think sometimes social media fools people into feeling like they're connected when they're really yeah. disconnected. Absolutely. They're in touch, but they're not connected. You got into gaming through somebody you met and gave you a shot, correct? Yeah. Is that, how, how that happen? Yeah, I had, um, so when I first moved out to LA, I had, um, I mean, I didn't have anything mm -hmm. or any. Like all of us. Right, I just went on Craigslist drunk and sent me drunk work <laughs> emails at like three in the morning and something worked out. Um, so yeah, I was doing additional music and um, ghostwriting, mm -hmm. that type of thing, helping other composers for like six years, pretty long time. Mm -hmm. And then there was an opportunity uh, Assassin's Creed was looking for their next composer and the composer I had worked on the previous one under that composer and mm -hmm. he wasn't trying to get it so there was no like competition mm -hmm. issue mm -hmm. um, and I was able to submit a reel and you know give it a shot. And was that when the blind test was? So yeah. they, they didn't know who it was they yeah. just picked the music which there, probably worked There was a, a supervisor over there um, who she's fantastic and I don't know if maybe being a woman, she she liked doing that to just try to give more people a chance. Mm -hmm. um, but that was that was really awesome that she did that because they you know they didn't know who I was mm -hmm. or they maybe would have had preconceived notions if they did before mm -hmm. they heard the music. So mm -hmm. that was great. Yeah. The um, the uh, another thing we're a proponent of that our audience should know and I'd like to see you speak to it is push the envelope, stand out be a hybrid. <laughs> um, and it feels to me in the gaming 
industry because of your success and other people. There are a lot of really powerful executives and other folks mm -hmm. that are female in the gaming industry. Do you see it diversifying and opening up for people? And I mean, um, that's probably still yeah. ways to go, but is it? Yeah, I don't know if started? I've seen it many female executives I, I in the gaming industry. I've seen, I've seen a few. Uh, a few, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I typically work with teams of just like 20 dudes. Just dudes. Yeah, it's rare. It's just twigs and berries. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, but is it growing? That, I think that, it's growing, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it's a conversation now and mm -hmm. pe just getting people talking about it more is going to help and but if you're going to try to get a career be it male or female mm -hmm. gaming has an opportunity for people who are musical i think they're more audio. welcoming i would say mm -hmm. yeah what's the future hold pop music stuff yeah for bit? sure yeah. um i want to do i want to put music out just as me mm -hmm. um and I want to collaborate with people more. Mm -hmm. That's we, we actually have one of your collaborators here. Should we bring him up? We do. <laughs> right. So joining us at the table, a guy you all know well, a good friend of the show, and a collaborator of Sarah Schechner, the one, the only Mike Dean. Bye. What up, dude? What's up? What's up, man? So how did this unholy alliance come together? Uh, was it Modern Warfare? Was that the... Yeah. Tell, tell us about it. Um, so the multiplayer... Part of the game is done at the pretty much at the very end. Mm -hmm. It's like a scramble at the end after single player. So and, single player first, then yeah. multiplayer after that. Yeah, gotcha. And um, the idea of maybe doing a collab had been thrown around. I, Call of Duty has done that before, where like a big artist does a track for mm -hmm. a menu or something. Mm -hmm. So we talked about that a little bit, and then I wanted to use it as an opportunity to collab with somebody that I wanted to work with. There you go. And Moog, the lovely Moog. 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 <laughs> um, <Mog. laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they texted him and were like, yeah. kind of tested the waters to see if he was interested. What made you interested? Um, seeing her video on the Matriarch synthesizer. Mm. So it was pretty She was cool. a badass? Yeah. <laughs> uh. Because it, it takes that in order to get you involved. You're not just oh, going definitely. anywhere. You're yeah. very you're very specific. How did it, it obviously worked out. What was the magic? Because you guys started to do one thing and did like four or something, right? Yeah, you it turned more. into more. Yeah. She came over and I played her a bunch of shit. And, you know, stuff that I've been working on for other films that didn't get used and things. Mm -hmm. And she was into it. And we just started sending each other like quarter finished ideas mm. and just back and forth. Mm. What was it about well. his stuff that, that worked for that particular thing? Was it just so different than what you were nearly had to work with? Um, did it inspire you? Or? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, just being a fan of the, his production and his synth work, sure. I was already was hearing like how that would fit in. It's cause when we first started doing it, he was like, Oh, what do you want me to sound like Hans Zimmer? And he pulled up something from Modern Warfare 2. And I'm like, You said no. No. I love she that. Said, Fuck yeah. You. Yeah. I was like, stop listening she said, to that. Do you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Why why else would I be asking to collab right. with him? Right. Um yeah. so yeah. would have called Hans Zimmer. Yeah. Well, uh -huh. did, yeah. Did, did all of the um the, the YouTubes he did at the Moog Moog Factory uh influence you? Yeah, I love that. Uh, the one with the one the one with the Van Halen solo for Oh yeah! Oh my god! Well, and, yeah, like the Jan Hammer solo. I mean, growing up like that, yeah. I was exposed to all that music from my dad, and just like intense yeah. instrumental mm -hmm. music was kind yeah, of. I my found thing. that out after we worked for a while. That her dad worked with Jan Hammer and all that. Shit. Crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like one of my big influences when mm -hmm. I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I feel like we just kind of connect musically with mm -hmm. that background, and then um, he would send me just stream of conscious ideas. And that's exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Just raw, like open-ended jams. And then I was able to curate and like decide what parts of it I wanted to use. And then I would produce the entire track mm -hmm. around his initial ideas. Mm -hmm. And I was, at the same time, I was doing um, like experimental string sessions with this group of six cellos and three basses. Oh, wow. And I was having them play a bunch of metal riffs Love and then, it. and it would also be like, well. yeah, it was yeah. really cool. And we, was. there was like interactive um, stuff where I'd be like, okay, you guys start on this note, you guys start on this note. And over the course of eight bars, you're going to slowly get to like this other chord nice. and then 
mix in weird textures. So it was really fun to do those sessions and then mix that with what you, he was doing. You know what would be fascinating, just as a fan of both of yours, because you did a, a performance, right, where you played on a MIDI controller and had a whole orchestra. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, you guys live <laughs> doing something. Yeah, I'd like would to be, that. He's already be doing it. Well, I know he is, yeah. and you do it too, but together you guys would probably create something I'm yeah. I'm down. Really I unique. Oh, cool. Definitely. Well, I want to be involved. So, hey, we'll yeah. Get to but that. we're gonna do more. We need more to make music. more music. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. did make more music, but we're gonna like score films together too. Oh, cool. And... What kind of stuff are you guys working on together? I think stream of conscious. Stream of conscious shit and send it back and forth to each other. Cool. And... See you know, where that goes. Yeah, we both like to work in our own environment. I think it's <laughs> yeah. so but, but very it. specific. You know, all our another shared place is both shit. you guys are are techie nerds. Like you must love gear and getting together and and working on stuff. Like, is they, that a shared they, they love? They dream about their modulars. That's what they do. He, he, oh, did, he only has the big format modular. Yeah, I don't have Euro rack stuff. Mm. Well, I've got a bunch of the Behringer stuff, which is really. Mm -hmm. I leave the eight oh eights to him. He, he takes care I, of that yeah, side. Yeah, the low end. Right, the low end is. Do you use plugins a lot? I do. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Anything? What's your go-to stuff? Like what's your go-to EQ? Um, Fab There's only filter. One right answer. Fab filter, Mic DSP, mm -hmm. Active EQs. Mm -hmm. Um, oh. yeah. <laughs> But basically, sometimes the built-in Cubase. Do you have mixers easy. that you that you rely on to mix your mix your music? Do you, are there specific people? People, that, yeah. Oh well, for the games um, where Sony is involved, they will mix it, okay. and I have a pretty good relationship with them now. Them like understanding my aesthetic because mm -hmm. I, you know, I hand I mix my stuff to like it's like eighty percent there, and mm -hmm. then it just needs that like polish. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. um, but they have to understand that everything's there's like distortions and, uh, and I'm not going to unbake things. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. they're pretty much What's just like. What's your go-to distortion plugin? Um, I just got the Electron Analog Heat. Oh, it's not a plugin. The Box. Mm -hmm. Love that for unlike drums and stuff. Um, but in in the Box, probably just like Decapitator, all the Sound Toy stuff. Um, the Retro Color has a pretty good built-in distortion it's cool and when can we expect a record from you my friend <laughs> a record uh, oh an album that record i may get an ep out in the next couple of months oh that quick yeah, okay. i'm trying to you know do some exclusive wax releases or something can you something, let us know when you when you're something really in? nerdy you know what i mean really yeah, exclusive you're, and, you're really dirty is really <laughs> cool so yeah. it goes Go you know, wherever you want. To, both yeah. of you go as far. Your shirt says it all. Transform. Just transform what we're doing <laughs> and where you're going. And, and He's trying to. He deleted life. his album, though. Yeah, this is fucked up. Uh, he did, uh, well, not, not my album. Purpose. <laughs> Three songs, yeah. Does she send you things that inspire he you? Yeah, accidentally deleted definitely. it. Is that right? Yeah, she sent me like the stuff she did with the six basses and cellos. Mm -hmm. And I would like try to program to that. Mm. She's got weird time signatures and shit. It's hard to follow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. There's times things slowing down. Just, yeah, especially since we're on different DAWs, you know, we don't just pass the file. It's just Ooh. stems. Just passing oh, stems, I so I have to try to... But he sent me a tempo map for one of the collabs that we did for Call of Duty. Did that work? Yeah, it worked. It, but I had, go, to, I had yeah. to manually... <laughs> Your tempo map didn't work, so I had to like calculate. I don't know what I did, but I, I think got you quarter about clicks. Yeah, but everything you send is like off. There's like lag and so whatever. <laughs> the, the clicks are off. Of the <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, we're trying to like just keep shit laid back. But the tempo <laughs> no. slowed down over like the course of 32 bars. Yeah, and it was so cool. Um, so I was just like playing along with that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it went from like 140 to like 60. Over yeah, it was ridiculous. And then it sped oh, wow. way yeah. back up, oh. even higher than it started. And I drew all kinds of weird little... Were you assisted when you were making that music? Was there anything that was assisting you with your Enhan mind expansion? Enhancements. No, no, not at all. No, no. You work naturally. Totally sober. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you said, of course I work naturally. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's smoke a joint. You know. Mike Dean is famous on our show for a number of things, which we'll tell you. What I don't you smoke want. blunts anymore. Ah. I, I quit smoking in tobacco. Got gotcha. you. That seems to be a trend. I see a lot of people going that way. Yeah. It's unhealthy. Yeah. Trying to live longer. Get, yeah. You know what I mean? It's a good thing. Enjoy my sense longer in my family. <laughs> so you didn't work this hard to get here to then have yeah. an end, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, God, the, the the possibilities of what could happen between you guys. Yeah. I mean, really every time I'm working on a project now, and 
a hero part that I think she could do, I send it over to her. And, mm-hmm. You know, like we did the Jack Boys thing, mm-hmm. the What to Do song. How did that come about? about that. How did that come about, the Jack Boys thing? One uh, day. I had one day to do it. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Well, you had like Two days hours before Christmas, you're like, "Are you still in LA?" And I was like, "Well, I'm leaving tomorrow, but yeah." Well, that means you have a day. Yeah, I, <laughs> I had other work these... I needed to do, but that all got pushed aside. Yeah, and it came out amazing. I it was really good. Yeah, wow. But what, that like that's what to do. What yeah, to do. the echo stuff he put on the string, the outro, he made it all trippy with like this yeah. tape echo <clears> thing <throat> that was it's all speed the delay times up and down. So, whoa. yeah, that oh, was my favorite cool. part. That's a yeah. great idea. You know, old. You guys like moving. Old in what you do. Natural, non Yeah, I like a lot of warbling. Drug yeah, assisted yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Wobbly stuff. Wobbly. Things that, yeah. yeah. How, how, cool. how did, uh, how did the, um, the Pines uh, 07 come about? That was the same thing almost. Well, you had more time. That one that. was actually we did before, but it came out after, I think. What Didn't I, I did that in November, the strings for it. Probably, yeah. And then probably we sat, sat on it for a while. Oh yeah, that's right. I never the important it, thing so. is, is what 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 did you use for that distorted sound? Everything's distorted in that thing. Which one? The pine. The intro the sound. Yeah, the intro sound. What was that's all that? Fender Jazz Master, the, the weird funky uh-huh. bar on it. Uh-huh. Playing through Moog Grandmother <laughs> through the filters in the Grandmother. Wow. It's just really really shitty sound. It's cool. You know what I mean? I love the sound of yeah. that. It's it, really it sets up the mood. Yeah, it, it's it, cool. it, when, it, tell me if it's this way for you. When when, when a sound cre- causes you to have an image in your mind about that sound, it's more real to you and more more fulfilling. I made that a, beat for a group called City Morgue, which is like a mm-hmm. hardcore rock mm-hmm. metal metal mm-hmm. rap band. Mm-hmm. We had the number one rap album a few months ago. Mm-hmm. Congrats! I mean, rock album. I mean, I love it. But um. I made that beat for them, and then oh, Shake sang on it. And it was like, and then I got to this one part, and I'm like, this needs to sound like Led Zeppelin right here. And I said, I'm gonna send it to Sarah. She, was, she just did her own thing on it, you know? Yeah, I played like a an instrument from Kazakhstan that's like, sounds like a dying cat, but if yeah. you mic it up close, it can sound cool. Yeah. Just layered a bunch of those. Oh my God, that's just a, one of the things the, the dichotomy between you both, I think, is also good for audiences. You're in your studio doing your thing, and you're in your studio doing your thing, but your studio is kind of like a bedroom studio. Mm-hmm. It's in your house, right? It's in my house, yeah. Head. So is mine. So yeah. is his. So <laughs> you don't necessarily have to go to the big commercial studio to be successful. You don't right. have to be making right. good things where you are. With well, it makes a master everything out of my place. So, yeah. Right, right. Doesn't do it go anywhere with iTunes from my house. No need to, to go elsewhere. Yeah. No master for iTunes crap at the mastering house. No, that. <laughs> uh-huh. I mean, I do, I do all my stuff master for iTunes, but yeah. But I do everything I give to Spotify, and to like, you know, all the different. It's all the same. Yeah, it's all mastered for iTunes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pulled back like a tenth of a dB, and mm-hmm. but you, you know, do it yourself. Just less overs, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is good. Now the other <laughs> thing is, we're gonna test you guys on. Uh, Mike's uh, experience at this, Sarah's a newbie, but she's coming with strength. And so I believe she's mm, going to I don't know about that. You go uh, first on all the questions. Oh, God. Um, well, ladies first. What are we doing? Mm. You can we can do them together. Yeah, if you want. On your mark, get set, pitch. Key. Song key. E flat. Mm. What? what? You? I don't know. C e flat? <laughs> C e flat. C minor. Okay. Yeah, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing you. That's wrong. I'm teasing you. I actually you. like D flat better than E flat. E flat is all wrong. I'll take that. I'll take that. Sample packs. Yeah. <laughs> Meh. Virtual sense. Yeah. Yeah. Serum. I use them. I use them. You'd be amazed at some of the shit that's virtual sense on my stuff. I probably wouldn't. I'd You'd probably never believe know. it. <laughs> Cellos. Love. Inspiration. Where the hell is it when I need it? <laughs> Sample strings as opposed to live strings. Only as like a layer underneath live strings. Yeah. Trent Reznor. Badass. Good for him. <laughs> I don't, what? He's doing well. 
good for him. That's a great answer. He's had an okay career. I kind of thought maybe he was somebody you liked. I do, I do. Um, but we're going to take this shit over. But move over, Trent, because <laughs> we're coming. Go over, Beto. There you go. That's the right. He's amazing. Okay, tempo. 100. 140. Damn. Okay, this is for both of you. The cheapest piece of gear you used on a on an important record or a record that came out or, or a, in your case? Cheapest piece of gear? Probably the... I think I showed you that $10 sampler app on iPad. Oh, that's really cool. I love that thing. I love 10 bucks. Wow. Can, can you give us a name? Of the, it's called Sampler. Sampler. S A M P L R. That's yeah, really cool. It's $10. The multi touch sampler you can. Yeah, it's all tactile. All you play really. everything. It has oh, a yeah. lot I'm of different get, features. I'm gonna get that. It's really so cool. fun. I love distortion on everything. And how about you, Mike? What was yours? What's the question? Cheapest again? piece of gear you ever oh. used on something? <laughs> Um, probably a Behringer, like, small stone clone. Oh, okay. Mm. I don't use that on my Fender Rhodes all the time. This is just for you, Mike Dean. Endlessly inspiring. Sarah Shackner. Cello. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was just, I, the cello was still echoing. Cello, and I was like, where are we going? No. Uh, cello. I mean, he only thinks of me as a means to provide strings. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> You're the string sister. <laughs> No, so limiting, Mike. Damn. No, I'm like just crazy, like <laughs> crazy. Yeah. Have you ever, have you ever held? No, her music That's is accurate. like crazy. That's her music accurate. is like crazy. It's yeah. like really cool. Before we go, one of the things I wanted to ask you was the difference between you creating your own string and orchestral stuff, mm -hmm. and then utilizing a live orchestra. Is it just the power of a live orchestra that makes it? Because they're very different, right? Yeah, they're very different. I mean. A lot of times if I am using a live orchestra, I still put my stems in there of me playing because mm -hmm. it's a texture that I like. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is, it's a power thing. Like me recording myself on the same mic, same instrument, same over person, same room over and over right. is not going to sound the same mm -hmm. as one a the, group. Right. One, one of the biggest thing is that uh, the scent strings don't leave after three hours. <laughs> they don't smoke. No, <laughs> but they can't do any cool textures. Right. But they or, are. But you know, I use a lot of fake strings. That even whenever I hire people to play on top of them, mm -hmm. in pop music, it's yeah, more of a place it, for that. For sure, because yeah. it's really hard to record real strings and make them sound as good as yeah, mm -hmm. some of those libraries sound like. Right, right. you know, but it has a, a more of a a fake in your face sound i don't know how you describe it i think it fits into the mix better for yeah. that well our industry's in good hands uh with collaborations like this i think that technology is allowing the envelopes to be pushed and it nobody could have ever imagined you two would come together and then just be so inspired and so good and as somebody who has benefited from Playing the game and feeling the work. Yeah, that's cool that you played the game. It made yeah. it perfect oh, no, it's, 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 yeah. it's really amazing. Um, and in wrapping up, you know, you guys are always welcome to come back. And for our audience, look at what you learned today. You take Sarah Schachner, who came out from Philadelphia and just has evolved into not only a creative force, but also finding her own way through it and creating things that you like to deal with and dealing with projects that are across the board. We always tell you that audio is very wide, but you can attract collaborators like Mike Dean to genius like Sarah Schachner. The future is good. And take this, be inspired by it, move forward, and we will see you next week.